Torch, the Christian Sight Loss Charity. Torch News, Extra Time, Emma Major. Emma, so you've written Little Guy, um, which sounds amazing. Um, I was just wondering, I've, I've read all about it, and I was wondering where the inspiration for it came from. So, absolutely straight download from God. It's a complete gift. So I've never drawn anything like it. And in January, I just woke up one morning with three images in my head, which are uh, the first, the second, and I think the fifth in the book. And they were literally crystal clear images of little guy. And um, the first one with him sitting on the edge of a cliff, just sort of gazing out. And I thought, this is really weird. <laughs> what is this? And kind of ignored it. And by the end of the day, I was like, I can't ignore it. I've got to try and get it down. I kind of knew I wouldn't be able to. It was just, this is crazy. I'm not going to be able to draw this. I've never done anything like it. And they just flowed onto paper. I mean, it's so hard to explain, but they just went down. They've never been adapted. They're in the book exactly like they were drawn the first time. And then I've been writing poetry all my life. So the poems just came with them. And then over the space of the next two weeks, 25 of them just kept, they just kept coming to my mind and I just kept drawing them down, literally just putting them on the side, thinking, I have no idea what this is about. And, um, and yet they seemed to flow. It seemed really clear to me that there was a story in them. Um, and so I started putting them on Facebook and going, look at these what do people think do you like them you know <laughs> this is nothing i've done before and everyone's like these are really powerful emma like these are really cool you need to share them and i'm like really i mean they're just my weird drawings <laughs> and i just i literally put them in a file i had a friend help me put them in a file in the order that i thought was right for them and put them on one side and then lockdown happened and I was suddenly like, oh, look at this. A little guy on his own, despondent, scared, lonely. Oh, don't we feel a lot of that right now? And so I started posting them again and saying, you know, this really feels like now. And, and all those people said, yes, seriously, I mean, you need to do something. Well, then, yeah, stop mucking around now. These are really important. These are going to give hope and love to people. You need to get them out there. And then people contacted publishers for me. And before I knew it, four weeks later, the book was published. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been a complete whirlwind. There's no other explanation that God wanted this to happen. I mean, what else could possibly be going on? <laughs> wow. That's, that's true inspiration, isn't it? True, pure inspiration straight into your brain from God. And Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. And I've never had anything like that before. You know, I, I, I'm a minister, so I feel called by God and I get lots of, you know, pushes and people speak to you and I'm like, oh, I see God at work. But never anything like this. Wow. I suppose that shows we, you know, we don't all have to have just one calling. We can all be called in different ways at different times in our lives. Yeah. And it has really reminded me the importance of listening and being prepared to take action even if that action is I mean I can't even see the detail of the drawings I drew mm. I have to get a magnifier out or take my camera take a photo and zoom in to be able to see it because I can't see enough that's amazing it but is it, it came out and I'm sure God is working in so many of us in ways like this you know small ways big ways and we just when these things come to us and we're like that's a bit strange well let's let's assume god's going to work great stuff through it mm, yeah and i suppose that's one of the things having the courage of the convictions to just go for it and just put them out there and go well this is what i have here it is yeah <laughs> but also so thankful to friends who realized that i was never going to take the leap of contacting a publisher mm. and who just went yeah let's just do it for her seriously <laughs> So that again is, you know, a community and a support network and other people who 
who raise each other up. Mm. Yeah, which is wonderful. That is a wonderful thing to see during lockdown when people are feeling isolated, to see communities supporting and strengthening each other. Absolutely. Yeah. And then obviously another exciting thing that came from this was your appearance on Grace and Perry's Art Club. So Which was a completely surreal experience. Yeah, what, what <laughs> happened there? Um, so <laughs> because the Little Guy book was out and there were press releases out um, and I'd done some radio and, and various things, um, the producers or whatever, it, it got heard about and so therefore um, they said, well, would you like to have a conversation with Grace and Perry? And I was like, you're kidding. I would die for a conversation with Grace and Perry. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, this can't really be happening. <laughs> so before I knew it, I had a Zoom scheduled. I was sitting right here, just like we are. <laughs> and there's Grayson. And I turned into a fangirl. <laughs> so um, 20 minutes. It was a 20 minute conversation. So five minutes have made it to the telly. And he was just really interested in what I see, what I don't see, um, my love of art. I've always loved and admired art, but have never been an artist. And we just had this fabulous conversation about hope and finding, um, finding the joy in every moment about peace. Um, he asked me about my faith and God and that and all sorts of things. It was just a wonderful, it's one of those things that will always stay with me as an amazing conversation yeah and was you know going on the telly was watching yourself on the telly is really weird <laughs> and listening to yourself on the telly oh that's really weird <laughs> that's the worst isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but actually having that conversation will stay with me forever and hopefully i will get to meet him at an exhibition you know he's putting this exhibition out and he wants my very basic sketch of what I can actually see to be part of it oh that's fantastic what and I'm really you... hope yeah and I'm hoping really good stuff comes off it because he was really honest that he'd never he'd never really thought about what people who are visually impaired um, see or how we interact with art or how that might be important to us so who knows maybe it will change things Fantastic. And it's wonderful as well that you're able to share your own personal faith with him and your faith story. And, you know, lovely to hear like he was engaged with that and interested to hear. Yeah, him. yeah. Well, he's yeah. just a, he's, he, he likes people. Mm. I mean, he, he, he is exactly like he comes across on the telly. He just likes people. Mm. So, yeah, he wants to yeah. share our stories. He always comes across as very interested and genuinely interested in whatever he's experiencing, yes. which I think is such a lovely quality and such a great yes. way to share things with the world. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That is brilliant. So um, obviously we've talked a little bit about faith. I was wondering if you could kind of share your faith journey with us a bit. Tell us your personal experience of, of going through faith. So um, I was brought up going to church. So, you know, christened as a baby and then um, brought up in the church. I fell out of love with church when I discovered that science and evolution was, you know, a big bit of science and uh, Sunday school didn't exactly agree with my ever so many questioning. Um, so fell out of love with church and then in my late teens, God was just there for me endlessly. So I fell out of love with church but not God. I prayed all the time and I had Christian friends and I'd go to Christian youth things. Um, and then in my late teens, I just felt God was with me so much, was really sustaining. And that continued through my early 20s and in and out of churches would try and leave. Um, and then uh, when my daughter was born, when I was pregnant with uh, my daughter, it was so important to me that she was brought up with faith with that community of faith and so i went to our local church and our vicar then was just endlessly positive about new people and said come it'd be brilliant come meet people he was really good at pointing in the right direction and uh, so i joined was on church council within six months <laughs> <laughs> not entirely sure how i said yes to that <laughs> um <laughs> And 
and and I've been there ever since. So that's uh, almost yeah, fifteen years. Mm. And uh, when my daughter was so, I was an engineer originally. When my daughter was born, I gave up that career. It I couldn't imagine how I was going to be a part time engineer mm. and mum. Mm. So I said, you know what? We've been waiting a long time for our daughter. I'll give that up. And I studied psychology and counselling um, in my spare time. I'm still not sure where that spare time came from with a baby, but hey. And uh, then everybody at church was like, we get what you're doing, Emma, but you're having a calling into ministry. You really are. So I um, denied it and avoided it until God wouldn't let me annoy it for it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been a, a licensed lay minister and a pioneer minister for uh, eight years, nine, eight, nine years. Um, so I am, I, God calls me to bring him and the love that he has always gifted to me and that I know he has for everyone to people outside the church. So I do all sorts of things inside church and in the lockdown I've been Mrs. Technical for our church, putting services online and things like that. But my real passion is for the people who find life so hard and don't know God loves them and to reassure them that God is there for them and they are loved and absolutely valued so that is that's is that a nutshell enough that's an excellent nutshell <laughs> that's a brilliant nutshell I feel like it's it's very evident in everything that you do and say that this is a passion for you, that, that making church accessible in different ways is important to you. Uh, whatever barriers people may find, whether those barriers are physical or mental or emotional even, sort of breaking those down and, and letting people find their way in is really yeah. important. And can you, can you, I don't know, tell us about about that about your involvement in broadening access to church well i've always been passionate about it because i think at formative times i felt excluded from church you know that mm. idea that somebody in their teens should question faith and that be wrong has always stuck me that teenagers should question everything in life i mean that's the i'm now living with one so you know it's not the easiest thing but mm. it's part of a teenager's remit isn't it mm. and I just, Jesus went out there. He didn't stay in temples. He turned tables. <laughs> he went out to the lame and the sick and those who were on the fringes and those who should have been hated and he loved them. So it's, I'm so passionate about it. And it, uh, through my sight loss, because I lost my sight four years ago, literally in sort of 10 minutes. So I went from, you know, needing glasses to legally blind in 10 minutes. And I didn't realize how hard it is to access services in church when you're blind. So how do you access the hymn books and the, the orders of service? And how do you even find out when the services are, when it's written on a board? And things are put on the screen and you can't see it. And communion is a very visual thing mm. and you can't see it. Mm. And I felt very excluded again. I felt loved by God, but excluded by the process of church. And I realized that there are, you know, I, I don't know the stats for how many people there are with visual impairments in the country, but even just looking at older people in our congregation, so many of them struggle to see. As you get older, it gets harder as well. And so I started saying, okay, we need to be really, um, my words have totally gone. We, we need to be, um, to actively plan to provide for people who can't see well. So we need to have large print and we need to say to people, if you'd like things emailed to you beforehand, that can happen. If you need any assistance, it can happen. If you need to speak to somebody to figure out what church might be like, come and speak to us. There's people in our congregation who are blind, who are deaf, who use wheelchairs. Let's make church accessible. Mm. yeah and yeah. site loss friendly so we are a site loss friendly church St Nicholas mm. Early which is the church I'm part of mm -hmm. and yes we still do things wrong and sometimes I think oh that you know I'll do it myself I'm like, oh that was not site loss friendly that was not mm. but our heart's in the right place and we're trying mm. well that's what it's about it's trying <laughs> and 
we're all human we all make mistakes but <laughs> yes. and that's yeah. been very important to me online as well mm. so a lot of people have put on services and the print's really small on screen or they've assumed people can see on screen so and i've said let's do it big if you're watching the service on a 50 inch tv i don't think you're going to complain that the words are too big mm. but if somebody's struggling on a small tablet it could make all the difference mm. and we email out the order of service beforehand with the hymns so people can find that and read that or use whatever technology so we try the best we can mm. That's interesting because I think it's a whole new world to a lot of people, virtual church and everything we've been doing during lockdown. And, and it's really interesting and important to sort of develop some best practices for those to be sight loss friendly. And that's something Torch is working on, actively trying to create help and advice for that. Yeah, um, yeah. and I, I just love the support that comes out of Torch Trust. It's been the Sight Loss Friendly Church Initiative. It's accessible. It's easy to get on the bottom rung of the ladder and work your way up. It doesn't feel like it's a jump too far, mm -hmm. which some of these initiatives can feel like that. Yes, yeah, I think I feel like baby steps is maybe a more helpful way to go than saying you have to change everything all at once. And, and a lot of churches can't afford to make huge changes all at once and yes. kind of end up giving up, I suppose, whereas... Yes small individual adaptable changes they can just slot in so easily to what's already happening i think exactly yeah so i mean i thought one one example of your commitment to making everything accessible um on a, on a personal basis i read that you've actually recorded audio descriptions of the drawings in little guy which i thought was such a wonderful idea and like well, something people wouldn't think of but well you see one of my bugbears is that there are so many books come out. And I think, yay! Uh, no, I can't read that because it won't be audio recorded for another X months. And Torch is wonderful. So if I you know, email or ring up and say, I want to run, run this study at church, could this be audio described? I've been amazed how quickly Torch has been able to do that for me. But obviously Torch has got lots of people who need lots of books. So I was like, I cannot be a hypocrite about this. I cannot sit complaining about new books that aren't audio described and not have done it myself. So what better way than just sitting down in front of a screen and recording them? Perfect. <laughs> and then it was two members of Torch who are from the digital, the Facebook group. Um, I asked them to trial it and listen to it and check that it actually made sense before I released them. <laughs> So that's a good idea that's <laughs> and what another wonderful example of working with the community you're in to to try things to make sure that it all works that's fantastic well so one of the things that torch trust has given me is a sense of community hmm. um you know I, there's all sorts of community i didn't feel excluded by you know the communities i already had but to meet christians with sight loss and to be able to say so what does this, you know, for instance, what does the healing of the blind man say to you? How do you feel when that comes up in church? Well, there's very few people who would actually necessarily have that niche opinion. And it's so wonderful to be able to talk about our faith and talk about our lives and to talk about church. It's been really important to me. That's brilliant. Well, thank you so much emma and can we just finish with you telling people where they can get little guy because i feel like people watching this are going to want to so, <laughs> so um here uh, little guy's published by um wild goose publications which is part of iona the iona, iona community up in scotland so um but it's bought directly from them at the moment because it's an electronic book but in time we're hoping after lockdown that we'll be able to get a physical book published. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Emma. Thank, thank you. Support Torch through prayer, volunteering, giving. Find out how at torchtrust.org.